Welcome to the Office Hours podcast. This is TK Coleman and Isaac Morehouse. We're like the geek squad for your professional development. Got a job you're trying to get, a work-related issue you're trying to resolve, a project you're trying to complete, an obstacle that's holding you up? Well, you're in the right place. You bring the problem, we bring the nuts and bolts. This is where you get philosophical insight and actionable advice on how to take charge of your life and career. Do, 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 do. I thought you were gonna. I, at first, I thought you were singing uh, "Humming No Diggity." Oh no, I was. That would be good though. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's the first two notes right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was the John Williams Star Wars. Uh, hey man, you voxed me. Super upset, full of rage and anger yesterday. <laughs> put on some rant about something. I don't know. I put it on four times speed, so you just sounded like an angry chipmunk. I'm not sure exactly what it was about, but clearly, do you, do you always listen to my boxes on on four x speed? No, you, at, the default is two x. You get three x pretty frequently. Four x is a very extreme speed. I think my mom is probably the only one that gets four x <laughs> uh, very often. Uh, but you, sorry, mom, um, you have gotten four X a few times, uh, but it's yeah, really you, slow and, and for a long time, because <laughs> <laughs> you know, you'll have a great point and you'll repeat it like four or five different ways. So <laughs> if I got it on four X, I'm going to miss three out of four of the th- sentences. But since you repeat the same thing four times, as long as I get it one, you know, one of those times I get the gist of it. So, um, See, your, your substance, I'm style. For you, it's about the content and going deeper into it. For me, it's about how many ways can I say it? Because I'm I'm competing with with rappers, right? Like, like you're competing with great thinkers. I'm competing with great rappers. I'm like, how many different metaphors can I use this? How many different ways can I spend this? Yeah, rappers were like the you know the church, the black church experience yes. where you grew up, where it's like, I don't think the congregation properly appreciated what I just said. So let yeah. me keep saying it until they do you know <laughs> yes you gotta so, keep repeating it until you get that applause anyway what's up so so tell the people why you mad son in, in, the, in the words of face yeah what what uh what's grinding your gears old man coleman <laughs> man it's crazy because like it's a combination of some social media posts i saw and an article i read i've seen a lot of things this week about having the assertiveness to get your needs met um, you know, so, so, so for uh, instance, uh, there, there was an article on 10 ways to get your needs met and all the advice had to do with things like be direct, make a single request, tell people what you want versus telling them what you don't want, establish healthy boundaries, speak up for yourself, et cetera, et cetera. And then I, I saw a question on Quora where someone was like, Hey, I'm interviewing for a job. What are some good questions I should ask? to figure out if this place is right for me. And all of the questions were kind of like these scrutinizing questions to make sure that the people that you're interviewing with are are, are really going to meet your demands and all this kind of stuff. And it just kind of got me thinking about a lot of the advice that goes out to people who are looking to improve their ability to get what they want from others. And all the advice falls in the category of something like improve your communication skills, you know, raise your level of courage, respect yourself, establish healthy boundaries. And the one thing that seems to be missing from all these articles is arguably the most important aspect. It's the skeleton key that no one talks about. And that is being valuable. That the thing that everybody's missing is that value creation is the ultimate asset for those who want to get their way. And and I think like this harsh truth that so many people are afraid to tell others is that nobody cares about giving you what you want unless or until you are valuable to them, right? But if you are not valuable to someone, if they have no reason to care about you, they're not going to lift a finger to accommodate your preferences. If you really wanna get what you want from people, It's not just about speaking up and being honest and telling them what's on your mind and laying out your standards and having boundaries. It's about making yourself indispensable. It's about figuring out a way to get people what they want, to do it so well that it becomes really expensive for them to not accommodate your preferences. 
And, you know, it, 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 it becomes really expensive for them not to do that. So one, one example for me is whenever I would, I would do job interviews. So, so to get more specific, I remember applying for a bartending position at a restaurant. And two of the rules they had was, number one, everybody's got to work on Sundays. And I didn't want to do that. And the other thing was they, they are not hiring bartenders. I knew that I wanted to be a bartender and I knew that I did not want to work on Sundays and I completely ignored what they said. I didn't tell them that because that's part of the strategy, you know, being selective in what you reveal. But I knew in my head something that I've always known, which is all rules are negotiable for people that are valuable enough. And I made up my mind, of course, they're telling me that they, they have no reason to care about me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to accept this job. I'm going to get in. And I'm going to spend my first three months being better than everybody else. I'm, I'm just going to go all in and make them value me. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to ask for what I want. I'm not going to be arrogant and entitled about it. I'm going to ask for what I want and I'm going to see what happens. The first time I went and asked for what I want, they kind of thought about it, but, you know, didn't give it to me. Second time I went, they gave me what I wanted. And, and, I, and I think that's one of the things that people underestimate about the ability to get what you want. You don't need all these great communication skills and assertiveness techniques and all this great self-knowledge if you are the kind of person who knows how to walk into a room, win people over, and become indispensable. Value creation, not assertiveness, is what you need if you want to get what you want. Well, and it takes some time and patience too. I mean, I had a similar situation. I think we've talked about this before, but when I went to work for an organization, I did not want to live in the DC area long term. I knew it. I, I hate the city. I, I think it's a horrible place <laughs> to this day. Um, but I really wanted this job. And rather than say, well, I need you to let me work remotely or to try to sell them on that, I just said, yeah, I'll take it. Hmm. And honey, we're moving to a city we know we don't like. And we're going to put a time limit on it, of three years max. And we're going to be out of there in three years, even if I have to quit the job. So that put pressure on me to make myself so indispensable that I could leave without quitting the job. And in two years, I didn't even have to ask anyone. I just told them, hey, I'm moving. And they didn't want me to because they'd rather have me there because they preferred to not have remote employees, but they didn't want to lose me. I'd made myself indispensable hmm. and, and created undeniable value. And so they're like, oh, okay, we'll talk about how that's going to work. And then I told them, <laughs> I'm moving in one month. You know, oh, okay, well, we'll, have a, we'll talk about the best way to work with that. It's two weeks now. Okay. And we never actually had any specific talk. They were just sort of like, they were, I think they were afraid to be like, no, you can't because they're afraid I'd quit, you know? And Again, I, I didn't do that to be a jerk. And I, I, my goal was to be so valuable to them that it didn't matter. And it really didn't. But creating value first is so key. And it, it takes a little time and a little patience. You know, you know, the whole like, here's how you can get what you want kind of industry. It always reminds me of this, <laughs> this great scene in the hilarious uh, movie, Waiting for Guffman. Uh, it's like a mockumentary Christopher Guest thing. And th this guy, it's like a community theater, this dentist guy, really nerdy. He's like, oh, I've always dreamed of uh, entertainment. He said, I mean, people often ask me, was I the class clown? To which I respond, uh, no, I was not. But I sat next to him and I studied <laughs> him. And it always reminds me, I think there's even a podcast. I'm not ripping on this podcast, but called We Study Billionaires or something like that. This whole industry of like, hey, I've studied successful people. Here's what they eat for breakfast or, you know, let me, Jeff Bezos' tricks to getting what he wants. And it's like, you know, five body postures that Warren Buffett has in shareholder meetings. And it's like, look, I mean, yeah, you can optimize your body posture so you stand in a power pose and don't cross your arms unless this, that, and the other thing. And, and maybe by some subtle Jedi mind tricks, you'll get what you want. But you know the real reason people listen to Jeff Bezos? Because he's just created stuff. That's why I love about when I, when I did fundraising, I was interviewing and talking with all these highly successful millionaires, occasionally even billionaires, and self-made. And they're like, they don't have all these like systems and stuff. It takes a second person. It takes like a journalist or somebody, a podcast interviewer to tease out of them. What's your system? What's your method? Because they just start they don't think about all this sophisticated trickery and like practices. They're like, I just build things that my customers value and I keep trying to make them better so that they value them more. And I build a company that people want to work for. And all those other things, those are little flourishes. You create, create value first. TK, let me ask you because 
I have people say this sometimes they kind of, they kind of mock, uh, and rightfully so. Cause it's, you know, it gets, it gets buzzwordy certainly that at Praxis, we talk all the time about value creation. Everything starts with value creation that, you know, I've, I've said over and over again, there are literally only two things that matter for your professional success, period. Everything else is irrelevant. One, your ability to create value and two, your ability to convince people that you can create value. And we talk about all this and you said the same thing, you know, value creation is the best way to get what you want. It's better than all these persuasion techniques. What do you mean by value creation? What's that actually mean? Sometimes people ask me that. Well, what does that mean? Yeah, it, it, it amazes me that we live in a world where using a term like value creation is like rare, <laughs> right? It's difficult to understand. I think that says a lot, not about the intelligence of people, but it says an awful lot about the way in which they're schooled and how, how, how destructive that can be. But what do we mean by value creation? I, I, one way I like to think about it is a, is a Zig Ziglar quote where he says, the best way to get what you want is to help other people get what they want. John Maxwell has a version of this that applies to relationships. And he says, you'll make a lot more friends by showing interest in other people than by trying to get people to be interested in you. I think the idea behind value creation isn't ignoring what you want or giving other people what they want at, at the expense of your own fulfillment, but recognizing that your fulfillment is inextricably linked to other people's fulfillment. And that the best way to go about getting your needs met is by incentivizing other people to meet those needs by showing them how it will make them better and genuinely doing so. And value creation, by the way, is something that we do in everyday life without being conscious of it. So for instance, uh, if I want to go to the movies and I want you to go see Star Wars with me, and I say, hey, man, come see Star Wars with me. And you're like, oh, no, man, they, they really messed up that series. I, I don't want to go see that. And I go, oh, come on, man. It, it, it'll be a good time. And, and, and our other friend Paul is going to be there. And this new movie theater, dude, is like the best. It's like a dine-in theater, and they have like the best menu. What am I doing there? I, I'm trying to get something that I want, your company, at the movies with me, by appealing to something that I think you might want which is the desire to have a good time, the desire to see your friend Paul, the desire to you know, um, experience you know, something new that you haven't seen before, et cetera, et cetera. Anytime we try to persuade someone of something, we are, we are appealing to their own self-interest. Now, some of us are good at it. Some of us are bad at it. Some of us do it genuinely, uh, or, or some of us do it like, <laughs> like how your brother Levi does, where he always pretends <laughs> like there's something in it for you. Uh, where there really isn't. But, but th th that, that's at the heart of value creation, man. Just starting with what other people want and getting what you want by appealing to that. Yeah, you know, and, and once you have a track record of that, your presentation is irrelevant. Like you've created so much value for me over the years that if you want me to do something, it's going to take very little. It doesn't matter how sloppy your presentation is. And I should mention, if you ever get our old buddy Paul to go to any movie with us, uh, I'm, I'm in. I don't even care what the movie is. Um, you know, I, I, I think of value creation, as you said, it's, it's, really just, it's, it's really just helping people. It's making people's lives better. But here's the key. When you say making people's lives better, most people think of like charity and all these. They think of ways that they imagine they can make other people's lives better. I'm going to do real good. According yeah, but that's, but that's just, cre that's creating value for yourself. That's making yourself feel good because you're like, it will make the world a better place and make people's lives better if I do this for them. Real value creation focuses on people's revealed preferences. Because the only way to know what, what's really making their life better is what they're willing to make some sort of sacrifice for, to pay some sort of price for? What are they willing to get up in order, give up in order to get it? And mm. you create that win-win when you do something that makes somebody's life better. And, and in return, they, you know, give you something or, or you know, they, they give something up. And so doing things to make people's lives better is really about what they show you through their actions that they really value, not just what they tell you. Hey, would you like it if I did this for you? People will say yes, but that's really not 
probably a very highly valued thing, or it might be, there's just not really a way to tell. So if you want to be ruthless about it and really be efficient in actually making people's lives better and thereby the world at large, do things that if at all possible, they have a money price attached to them. Profit is the best indicator of real value created. And there are other forms of value creation as well, you know, creating social value, whatever, but all of them involve people giving up something they value for something you value more. That's where the creation part comes in, that margin between the two. I give up two hours of my time, which I value in order to, to what I could have been doing with that time, in order to spend it at the movies with TK and Paul. Hey, Paul, uh, come to the movies with us because I value that more than the alternative. So by presenting this opportunity to me, by encouraging me to do it and me exchanging my time for it, I, I, value has been created. My life is worth more than it was previously. And nobody has lost. That's why it's a win-win game. Anyway. Um, hey, hey, let me follow up. I, I got a question for you about this win-win component because I think a big, a big hangup for a lot of people with value creation is that it, it almost sounds like you're asking them to have this naive faith in the benevolence of the universe, you know, like you're saying, hey, if you do right by other people, they'll do right by you. Or like, you know, if you just focus on helping people, man, you know, people will reward you and take care of you. And, and, and there is a passive approach to this or an uninformed approach to this that can lead to, uh, to failure or, 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 or to, to negative results. And, and everybody kind of has in mind uh, some person who, you know, uh, in their own minds, at least, they did right by others, but then other people didn't take care of them. So how do you distinguish the kind of value creation you're talking about from those moments where people feel like, yeah, I got screwed over. I tried that. You know, like I, I put I put my mom first and she didn't take care of me when I needed something. I, you know, I bought donuts for everybody at the job. And then when I needed a favor, no one helped me out. That stuff doesn't work. I mean, take the feedback from the marketplace. When you offer something and nobody wants to exchange for it, nobody wants to give you something of value in return, something that you value more than what you're giving, then clearly you're not creating value for them. If you walk away a loser, if you say, look, I created this, let's just stick with a product for now. I created this product and it cost me $10 per unit in resources and time and everything to create it. And I went out and tried to sell it for $20 per unit. Nobody would buy it. So it didn't create value for anybody. Nobody was willing to part with $20 to get this. That would have been a loss for them. That would have been value destroyed for them because they would have gotten less in value for the, from the thing than from the $20. If I lower the price to $10 or let's say nine, now people start to buy it, but that's a loss for me because I'm losing $1 every time that happens because I'm putting in more. And you can be mad at the world or you could just say, okay, what I'm doing, I think it's valuable, but no one else does. So I'm literally destroying value. I'm taking a bundle of resources valued at $10 and I'm selling them and the highest people are willing to give me is nine. I have literally destroyed value. These things were valued more by other people at their previous read. This is why losses are so important. Companies need to be able to suffer losses and go out of business when they don't. And products need to be able to die. Otherwise, value gets destroyed. And profits are also important. They signal that value is being created. Okay, so that's in a clearly business context. This happens in all other contexts as well. You know, if no one's willing to take you up on your offers, then if you're not creating enough value for them. You know, if you go to someone and say, hire me, you know, I want to freelance for you. And they say no, or they ignore you. You're not creating enough value for them. Now it could be because they're a bad person or they're misinformed or any other reason. You never, you're not privy to that. And you can spend your time worrying about that or being mad, or you can just say, okay, whatever reason they don't perceive me as creating enough value. Can I change that perception? Maybe, maybe not. It might be worth trying. And if not move on and try something else, it's better than just holding on to that bitterness. You know, uh, th this is also something that comes up when it comes to influencing people's behavior. We get a lot of questions that uh, that take the form of, hey, how do I get people to change? Right. Like, how, how do I get my son to stop smoking? You know, how do I get my girlfriend to work out more? We get a lot of stuff that's like, how do I get other people to do this thing they don't want to do that I want them to do? And apart from just leaving them alone, letting them live their lives and getting on with yours. One of the things we, we, we talk about a lot is how if you want to change someone's behavior, you got to stop trying to do that from a place of condemning them. And you have to start listening to them first, figuring out what they want and then appealing to it. So, you know, I heard a story of, of a father who was kind of irritated that his son was smoking all, all the time. 
And, and he kept telling him over and over to stop smoking and kept, you know, making all these arguments and his son wouldn't listen. But then one day he just, it just kind of hit him like, wait a minute, my son loves track. He loves to run. And he just kind of had a conversation with him where he's just asking him questions like, hey, does that ever worry you? You know, that, that, that you may not be able to realize your potential with that. And just having that conversation made his son think about it in a way that led to him quitting it and just giving it up. And, and, and it just kind of shows the effectiveness of value creation in every context, not just in business, not just with trying to make money, but even when influencing other people's behavior. You got to start not with how irritated you are with what they do, but you got to start with what their goals are. And if there's something you want them to do, you need to effectively sell them on the idea of how it's going to put them in a position to achieve their goals if they do that thing. So TK, I really think that you answering this next question is going to help you achieve uh, your goals in a big way. Would you be willing to do it? (laughs) Let's do it. Okay. This is the preview question from last week. How do you judge whether your blog posts are TMI, too much information? How do you balance your blog as a place where employers and coworkers will look and a place where you can write freely about more personal parts of your life? This is interesting to me lately because during, during my Praxis blog challenge, where we have a lot of uh, challenge, a lot of people to blog every day, um, I deleted a post after rereading it and realizing that it felt much too personal for a coworker or future employer to read. The nice thing is that during Praxis, I've gotten into the habit of hitting publish and caring less about who's reading or not reading my stuff. The part that makes me pause is whether I should more carefully monitor how much I truly share. Last time I checked, James Altucher is one of the few bloggers I've ever read who can make TMI, TMI, TMI look good. Thoughts? Mm. First of all, there's no such thing as too much information or too little information in any kind of objective sense. No such thing. Too much for one person is going to be too little for another. It's kind of like telling someone you talk too much. What that really means is I personally don't want to listen to you, right? But, but, but someone else might be like, oh, go on, go on. I want to hear more. Uh, too much, too little. It's all relative. Depends on the person. Depends on the context. So whatever you do, when you look for an answer to this question, don't look for any kind of objective rule that's going to apply to everything. That's the first thing. Secondly, it's not about how much information should I reveal. It's about how much ownership am I willing to take for the consequences of what I say. There is a price to pay for everything that you say. There you go, baby. I just did it. My first rhyme of the episode. (laughs) Yes. It took you a long time. I I, I started to worry about you. Man, I was trying to get out of the block. I was just rusty today, man. But finally, I hit it. Finally, I got in my groove. I'm usually in there like within the first five minutes. (laughs) There's a price to pay for everything that you say. And that doesn't mean that what you say is good or bad. It's just that different people respond in different ways. And what you got to ask yourself is, based on what that price is, do I care enough to have an opinion on this to, to, to pay for it? You know, so... Um, to pay or spend a day by the bay in the hay, I just <laughs> may. Am I getting it? Yeah, you got it, man. You got it. Arguing with people who make me want to go away. Um, (laughs) so one funny example of this and and you see this with a lot of the kids now is you have these celebrities who are really good at making money or 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 generating uh generating buzz by by triggering people or provoking people (laughs) and and and, and, you know they'll come on tv or whatever or, or write a tweet and it just makes everybody mad and they just revel in it and it just makes them more famous and more rich and then all the fans who look up to that person, they're like, yeah, I'm going to do the same thing. And then they get on Facebook and they write something provocative. And then an old buddy from high school is like, wow, I didn't know you felt that way. I'm pretty disappointed. And then, I'll, and then that person's just like their whole day is ruined. They're spending their entire day arguing on Facebook. I don't understand why people just don't let me think. And, and, and they prove through their actions that they can't handle the heat. And what they fail to realize about their hero is, what makes their hero successful isn't that they're bold enough to say what they want to say, but they're honest enough with themselves to own the reactions that other people are going to have to it. And that's the question you got to ask yourself. So, you know, if I tell a story about some breakup that I had uh, with a girl back in college, I'm okay with telling that story. There's no consequence I'm going to suffer for telling that story that I haven't already thought through 
and that I'm not already extremely comfortable to live with. Wait, because are you sure? Because I tried to get you to tell that story on my podcast once and you were real shy about it. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, we are witnessing in real time the <laughs> unanticipated ways in which you might embarrass yourself. By <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go on, go on. <laughs> Wait, you mean that girl that you were crying about back in the day? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. I wasn't going to say that part. <laughs> <laughs> I still haven't gotten over that because apparently... That's like my go-to analogy. I just realized that. I always bring that up. I clearly got to deal with that, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. I'm your therapist. Just let it all out. <laughs> Not your fault, Will. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, but, but, but it's really about your ability to own it. L- let me move on to another point because I'm, I'm repeating myself with this and I want to I give you the floor. A- another point, too, is I, I think a lot of people struggle with this TMI issue because there's kind of a lot of pressure on people to be more transparent. And it's leading a lot of people to struggle. Like, am I, you know, is it okay for me to be honest in this direction? Because I I think human beings already have a a natural filter, a natural ability to kind of feel self-conscious about sharing too much information. But, but, but transparency is one of those words like sustainability uh, where, Uh. yeah, right. Like there is a, there is such a thing as sustainable And, and in its proper context, it's a good thing, but it's become this buzzword where everybody feels the need to say like, yeah, this is sustainable, uh, you know, because they know it like, it's kind of like a, a virtue signal. And I, and I think the same thing is happening with transparency and, and people just kind of assume like the more transparent I am, uh, you know, the better I am, the more truthful I am. And I think it's important to make a distinction between being discreet versus being dishonest and understanding that being selective about what information you reveal about your personal life isn't the same thing as being dishonest because you don't have a moral duty to tell people everything that you're thinking or feeling independently of context and independently of the value that it creates. So number one, no, no objective standard for what is too much or too little. So don't look for a universal rule. Number two, it's not about what's too much. It's about what you're willing to own. And number three, um, don't put any pressure on yourself to be transparent. It's not intrinsically valuable. Uh, being discreet is not the same thing as being dishonest. Yeah, there's a big difference you can notice when, because of this whole transparency or authenticity kind of uh, thing these days, which is which is a, a reaction, um, largely good, to kind of overly squeaky clean, corporate brandy feeling, you know, content. And so real raw, you know, company founders sharing in real time what they're doing and people being real about their struggles, like, it's cool and it's a reaction to, to the opposite extreme. But when you can tell when someone's trying to be authentic just to be authentic because they think it's a good thing versus when they're just writing what's true to them and it happens to come across as very transparent and open or not, right? Like, and, and vice versa. When someone's being all polished and clean and non-transparent because they're trying to protect themselves and be too deliberate, you can sort of smell that versus when they're being that way because that's just what felt true to write. So I don't think going for either style in and of itself is a virtue or a vice. It's really about writing what's true. But I will say this in terms of the cost. As TK said, whatever you're willing to own the cost of is the limit. If you write it and you feel uncomfortable, I don't know if I'm, I don't, I'm perceiving some costs to this that I'm just not comfortable with. Maybe people would see it and they would think this, then, then that's an indication that the cost is too high. It doesn't make you sleep well at night. Um, and if you do feel comfortable, even stuff that other people would think was wild and out there. And if you're like, I'm willing to own this, I'm willing to endure the cost. Great. That's your, that's your test. But in terms of cost, keep something in mind too. Because you don't always know. And if you're trying to think about what are the unknown costs that might be there, what, again, this goes back to the first question, the more you have a reputation as being a valuable person, the more you will, the lower the cost will be, not, not always, but often to sort of too much information, to sharing a lot of personal stuff or whatever. So some kid no one's ever heard of writing a blog post about how, you know, they got whatever bad service at a restaurant or dumped by some guy or girl that's probably going to come across to people who see it. Like, who is this kid? Uh, the, what I see on their blog is just like some personal story about that. This is just too much information. What this is weird. I'm uncomfortable. If Mark Cuban or Michael Jordan 
wrote an article about their first breakup or bad service at a restaurant, they probably not have very high of a cost. In fact, it might be a benefit. In fact, their audience might be clamoring for that. They might want the TMI. They might want as much as they can get of the personal stuff. So the, high, the less you have a reputation of creating value, I think the higher the cost to having a lot of sort of TMI type stuff out there. And the more you have an established reputation for creating value, the more people find it interesting and intriguing and want to see more of that. Now, it doesn't mean there's not a cost at that point, but I think the equation, there's some kind of a continuum there. So I would say, um, you know, if you just always focus on creating value above all, the more that it's known that you do that, at least among the people that it matters uh, for, the less it's going to matter you know, that you're out there. If, if you have no reputation, you've never created value for anyone, nobody sees you as valuable, you're probably going to want to be a little bit more guarded at first until you sort of establish yourself. But if you are at least in your professional circles, you're really valued, you're really well known for what you do. Just it doesn't have to be like household name known, but just among the, the people in your you know, specific area or profession, then having your blog posts about your personal stuff probably isn't going to have that much of a cost to you. So that's another th- thing I think it's worth keeping in mind. Yeah, it's funny how it ties back in and what we were talking about before, how if you want to improve your ability to get what you want from other people, focus on value creation. I guess you can say it another way, if you want to improve your ability to get away with sharing what you want to share, it's be indispensable to people, you know, and and make that the context for why you're sharing things like make your information something that creates value. And you can see this in personal relationships, too, right? I mean, when you're getting to know someone like there are things you don't say on a first date. You know, uh, even if they're true, you know, it's like, so if you're thinking on a first date, I'm going to marry this person. Just don't say it. It's okay to think it. It's okay to think it. Just don't say it. Wait a little bit. (laughs) Have a conversation first. I'm going to tell you right now, you probably won't get away with that. You'll look like a creepy stalker. It's okay to think, but just give it a little while. Build some social capital first. And, you know, maybe a few months down the road, maybe after a year of dating, you can, you can say, Hey, I knew when I first saw you that I wanted to marry you and you'll get away with it every time because you're valuable now. (laughs) Yeah. You know, if you hear a a band that's put out thousands of songs or hundreds of songs and you like at least some of them, if you go and check them out on Spotify and the first song you hear from them is a crappy one, that's not likely to harm their reputation in your eyes that much. If you know that they have good stuff in general, it's like, well, they write a ton of stuff. I don't like it all. If you go find some new band on Spotify and they literally only have one song and it's bad and you don't like it, the cost is much higher to their reputation, right? So it's the same thing. If, if I go to your blog and the only thing there is like two posts and they're both really TMI type posts, I'm just probably not going to want it to stick around. If I read something that I don't like from a blogger who I normally like, it's not going to have that much of an effect. All right. Next question, my man. How do I become more than just an idea guy? and actually implement stable business ideas into a successful and profitable destination? Hmm. I mean, there's no such thing as a good idea. Mm. Okay? An idea that hasn't been created and implemented is not good. It just isn't anything. So having a lot of ideas really isn't valuable. Really. It's only valuable if generating tons of ideas results in activating one of them or more than one of them. So so how do you turn into somebody who knows how to implement ideas? Don't worry so much about ideas and just work. Just be a good worker. It doesn't even have to be on a new idea. Like if your goal is to create some revolutionary new business idea and you've got a a sheet of 50 business ideas and you don't know like how to turn that into action, go get a job for somebody whose idea already is a real thing and go learn how to make that real tangible thing more valuable. Go learn how to create value in the context of an idea that's already become a reality and help that reality grow in scale. If you want to learn how to be an executor, a doer, an implementer, go work in a context where people are already executing, doing, and implementing. Work alongside them. Because if you sit around with your ideas more and keep thinking of them and keep saying, how do I, how do I move from this to implementation? I think it's going to be a lot harder to get anywhere. Go learn to be an implementer first. And the idea is that's the easy part, man. 
if you've worked for 10 years relentlessly implementing and executing on other people's ideas, I think you're more likely to execute on your own ideas than if you sit around for 10 years thinking up your own original ideas, but never executing. So go learn the art of execution and implementation uh, from somebody in some context where they're already doing it. Forget doing it on a new idea until you know how to do it on an old idea. I love that thought, man. I love that. Now, now I'm just going to look for the opportunity to say to somebody, you're a brilliant idea. What's so good about it if you ain't acting on it? You know, uh, <laughs> what's so good about it? Um, okay, so one thing I'll say, man, is, is I, I think a lot of people who describe themselves as idea guys, they fall into that category right there of just not acting on it, spending too much time thinking or whatever it might be, getting stuck in their head. The other thing I see is the problem of FOMO, where people who are idea guys, they start something, but then they don't give it enough time to see what it's capable of, of becoming because they've got so many ideas that, you know, after two minutes, you know, they're impatiently itching to move on to the next one. And ideas need room to breathe. One of my favorite articles is uh, one we've talked about before called Give It Five Minutes. And he talks about this within the context of, of, of attacking other people's opinions. You know, someone says something that you don't agree with. Give it five minutes, right? There's no expiration date. There's no deadline on when you can disagree if you think someone's wrong. But before you try to criticize the idea, take some time to make sure you're understanding it in its best possible light. I think the same thing is true with acting on creative ideas. Before you give up on a creative idea, before you say, ah, this isn't coming together, I'm gonna move on to the next one. This one's boring me, I'm gonna move on to the next one. Give it some time, give it some room to breathe. Give that idea an opportunity to show you where it can lead you. I, I personally think that it's healthy to have the attitude where you say, it doesn't even matter if I like this or not, or if it works or not, as long as it's not clearly unethical, and as long as it's not harming me, I'm going to give myself X amount of days. This is why in practice for the professional development projects, we say 30 days. And if you get to day 14 and you're like, ah, this is stupid. You know what? 30 days isn't your whole life, right? 30 days, like stick with something just to see where it takes you. Give that idea a chance to show you what it looks like because when you walk away from an idea, you don't want to have any doubts. You don't want to feel like you not getting the full result result is a reflection of you not giving it your full effort. And I see a lot of people who have one foot in, they've got one foot out, and, and, and they're always so worried that their idea may not work fast enough or take them anywhere that they never give themselves a chance to see what their idea looks like if it's fully engaged. And then when things don't work out, they say, oh boy, I sure am glad I kept one foot out because you know I didn't lose everything. And sometimes it's the reverse, like you lost everything because you didn't put both feet in. Put both feet in and give it a go. All right, I'm gonna have to put a dime in the bucket. Two nickels in the bucket. Because <laughs> I, got, I got two little follow-ups. One is, sticking with it a little longer. It, what it really is in a way is giving the more reasoned or inspired version of yourself a chance to be proven right over the more impulsive reactive version of yourself. So if you set, I'm going to go and pursue this idea and I'm going to do it for six months, making that decision is a pretty big decision. And it probably took you a while to lead up to that, to making that commitment. My guess is that in the moment of that commitment, you had some pretty clear thinking, some inspiration, and quite a bit went into that. Two months in, when you're not feeling very inspired and you wake up and you have a bad day and you're like, you know what? I want to quit this. That usually comes from a very uninformed, very snap judgment, very responsive to the emotional highs and lows of the moment place. And sticking with it longer is really saying, I'm going to trust the version of me that chose to make this commitment in the first place, because there was a lot more that went into that than the version of me right now that wants to quit it. And so it's kind of trusting your own self, but like the superior version of yourself, or at least the version that has a probability of being superior than that momentary thing. Okay. The second point is the TK mentioned, and I think this is so important. People who are ideas, people that say, I struggle to, to focus and bring something to fruition and stick with it. I think it is the FOMO thing that's getting to you a lot. And I would say this, if your reason for pursuing an idea 
is because you're afraid that if you, it's such a good idea, if you don't do it, someone else will do it first. Don't pursue it. That's a stupid reason to pursue an idea. That's a terrible reason and you're guaranteed to fail. If the only reason you're motivated to do it is because you're like, I thought of this thing, this app, this business, whatever, it's so brilliant. I have to do it because if I don't, somebody else will first. And your whole thing is motivated by this like zero sum idea, this scarcity mindset, this panic, this I've got to go, I've got to do this before somebody else gets the credit, gets the glory, makes the money. If you always operate on that mindset, you'll never be able to finish anything because when you start moving on that idea, you'll get a new idea. And that one's even newer and even fresher. And maybe the one that you were working on, now a few other people have started to, you've seen some stuff here and there about another company or another guy or another girl that's trying to do it. And it's not quite as fresh and new, but now you've got an even newer idea. Oh my gosh, you got to go on that one because it's the newest idea yet. And you want to be the first one. So you got to move quick. And it's just going to keep happening and keep escalating. It's this constant FOMO. An idea that's worth pursuing and bringing into reality is one that you don't care at all. If you're the first, the last, the middle, you're not threatened or worried that, well, what if 10 other people are already doing this? Or what if 100 more people start doing this next year? If, if that doesn't change your interest, then that's good. Pursue that. You know, when I launched Praxis, it was different than a lot of other ideas I'd had because there wasn't any element of, well, whoever does this first is going to be the winner. And oh my gosh, I got to do it first. And it was like, look, I need to and want to do this. I don't care. If other people are doing it, great. If other people aren't doing it, great. Maybe that's a little concerning because the marketplace is maybe saying something. I don't know. I like to see some other people trying it, but like I'm not in some arbitrary time constraint. And I think catch yourself. If your reason for wanting to execute an idea is only because you think it's so fresh and new that if you don't, someone else will beat you, that's not a good enough reason. I don't think you're in love with that idea enough. I think you're in love with the idea of being first, not the idea of what you want to be first with. Mm. Mm. You just stopped me from from putting a a dime in the bucket because I realized the only reason I was going to add a comment was to just be the last guy to say something. I didn't really- <laughs> you just wanted to be last. Yeah. <laughs> and I realized I don't love what I'm about to say. I'm just trying to compete with Isaac. <laughs> <laughs> every, if you listen to this whole show and just imagine that every single answer is really just like a subtext conversation of me and TK trying to like secretly communicate frustrations to each other and one up each other, I think it'll make the whole thing more interesting. <laughs> It's like that uh, there's there's a Michael Jordan commercial where you see his North Carolina self playing against his pro self. Yeah. They're just talking trash and they're just going back and forth. That's what I imagine these episodes are. We're just, we're just going at it. We're gonna- <laughs> All right. I'm going to read a preview for next week. You cool with that? I'm ready. What do I do if my degree has pigeonholed me into a segment of my career that I really don't want to be in, even though it does pay the bills? How do I do something different without losing most of my salary in the process? We've been getting a lot of questions about uh, college stuff lately. Yeah, a lot more. The world needs us, man. The tide is rising. Do I don't know. I don't know if that's the appropriate metaphor. What's another one we can throw in? College is going down, baby. That's not a metaphor. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's a directional metaphor. Yep, it's directional. Because things are going things are going sideways for higher ed. <laughs> Down into the left, I don't know. All right man, good stuff. I'll see you next time. <laughs>